Okay, I think I'm going to get going. Um, this talk's called Open Source Security, a Vendor's Perspective, so it's going to be a bit different to all of the previous security talks you've seen, because this isn't specifically about Plown. It's about open source in general and how the security teams of open source communities uh, release information about vulnerabilities and communicate to our users and the people that package uh, software for Linux distributions and so on. So, my name is Matthew Wilkes. Uh, I'm the sort of de facto leader of the security team because nobody really wants to do it and I seem to be the one that wants to do it least. Um, I've been working with Plone since 2004 and I've been on the security team for I think three or four years now. Uh, and in that time we've completely changed all of the members from beforehand. So the security team that we currently have is very different to the one we had five years ago. And we've had to learn a lot of lessons again. Uh, also in my proper job, I do some consulting work, but I also do security audits for commercial software in uh, Plones, or Pyramid, all that sort of stuff. So I have to deal with this kind of thing on a daily basis. And the first thing I want to run through is the different concepts that we have in open source security and security in general. The first one is a user sends us an email saying, I've tried changing the URL while I was editing a portlet and everything blew up. I think it's a security vulnerability. And we type in the URL they went to and we confirm yes, it does all blow up. And we spend a few days trying to figure out exactly why it happens. Generally we find that what they found is a easy to find case of something much, much worse and then we lose a bit of sleep over trying to find all of the terrible things that you could do if you actually had read this code before. And then once we've done that, we say, well, how bad is this? Did the user who emailed us tell anyone else? Did they find something really bad or did they find a simple version of something that could be really bad? And what kind of access can you get? If it just slows the site down, that's probably not too bad. If it allows you to execute commands on the server the plan's running on, that's probably pretty bad and we should make that our highest priority. And then we do the bit that you've probably all seen the most. We develop a hotfix. Those are generally between three and 10 lines of Python code and look deceptively easy. But for the last hotfix we had, I think, 140 unit tests. Oh, he's done now. Uh, so the amount of work that goes into it is really huge because we don't only have to find one way of fixing a problem. We have to find a way that works on every version of Plone and doesn't break other things, doesn't break add-on products. Uh, if you install it on a, a Plone 2.5 site, it won't break LinguaPlone, which is the one we had last time that we missed. So that's a surprising amount of work. And then once we've done that, we release the lovely hotfix and everyone goes and installs it. And then we have to do the really boring bit of going back through the hotfix and back through the original bug reports and saying, right, now we've put a plaster on this, how do we fix it properly? How do we rewrite this code so that it doesn't look out of place in the code base? Next. We don't, no. So the, the question was, do we merge the unit tests that we write for the hotfix? And sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. One of the reasons that we don't do it very much is the unit tests are basically a blueprint to how to exploit plan sites. Uh, if you see the unit test for a particularly bad hotfix, you go, oh, I see, that's how you break into that plan site that hasn't got that hotfix installed. So we were a little scared about uh, providing those too widely. Oh, I should say as well, um, as Nate did, feel free to jump in with questions or comments or insults at any point. And if I get a bit too brummy and deep voiced and in unintelligible, then wave your arms at me and, and I'm very sorry to the people translating. <laughs> so that our workflow is when we receive the notification, we add it to 
a GitHub issue tracker in a private repository. And then we usually sit around for two or three days hoping that David's going to do it first or David hopes that Richard's going to do it first and eventually one of us says, okay, let's make sure this is actually a bug. And then we find the related problems and then we request a CVE. And you've probably all seen CVEs. They're the eight-digit numbers that go along with every vulnerability. And they are probably the main point of my talk because I'll wager that none of you have any idea how difficult it is to get those eight-digit numbers. We request the CVE before we write the hotfix. We don't actually receive it until after we've sent usually a two or three page justification to Red Hat as to why we're sure that our vulnerabilities are real, which usually is about two months after the hotfix comes out. Uh, I think the record that we've had is it's taken seven or eight months to get some CV identifiers. And once we've got those, we update plone.org with the CV numbers we were given. And the last stage is the vulnerability shows up on the National Vulnerability Database or other security databases. That step generally takes about two or three years. So, CVEs. As I say, they're an eight-digit number. What you probably don't know is there is a lot of back-end work. This is a copy of the certificate for, uh, I think it's McAfee antivirus that certifies that it is CVE compliant, and that it can handle eight-digit numbers that represent vulnerabilities. The CVE stands for Common Vulnerability and Exploit. And the word common isn't common as in it happens a lot. It's common as in there is one place to go. And no matter where you look to find information about a vulnerability, you can be sure that it will share the same number rather than having its own one. For example, Drupal generally numbers its issues as Drupal SA1, Drupal SA2, Drupal SA3, but there'll be CVE numbers as well, so you can then map the numbers that individual companies use with the numbers that other companies use. Uh, I think that's probably the worst description of what a CVE is in the world, but that's the official description from the MITRE website. And here's a quote from Steve Christie, who works for MITRE, who is one of the two people who's willing to issue CV numbers for open source projects. This is from a talk he did at Black Hat this year. In reality, all of the large vulnerability databases may have missed published vulnerabilities in the product. We routinely see this. And the problem there is, although you get these CV numbers, they are only a way of linking up the numbers that different organizations have assigned to the same vulnerability. There is no guarantee that they're complete or that they're accurate even. Once we've released the information on a CVE, it gets updated onto the uh, National Vulnerability Databases and that is generally a one-shot thing. Once someone notices a CVE has some information, it's copied into there and is stuck forever. So one of the most secure, um, severe vulnerabilities we had in recent years was listed as unspecified vulnerability in Plone 2.5 to 4.0, allows remote attackers to obtain administrative access, which is a really terrible description of a vulnerability. You have no idea what's going on there, but if you search for that common identifier, that is pretty much all the information you will find because the National Vulnerability Database has a really high page rank. And not all CVs are equal. There are two operations that can be done on them, or three, merge, split, and disregard. Merge happens when you accidentally get two CVEs for the same problem, and that's quite rare because it's so difficult to get CVEs. Split happens when you request a CVE and people later find out that there are differences in two different ways of exploiting it. For example, if a bug applies to Plone 3 to 3.1, and another one that does exactly the same thing in the same way is fixed in 3.1.1, that's two CVEs, even though the only difference is when a particular version of it was fixed. 
lots of uh, vulnerabilities have never get CVs assigned. Uh, some of you might have seen we did that commercially, uh, I and my business partner Alan did an audit for Plone Form Gen recently. That we requested CV identifiers for in May and we still haven't received them. And we've sent quite a few emails asking for that. Um, other projects such as Drupal I know also have difficulty getting CV identifiers. Uh, the workflow is you send an email to a mailing list, you explain the problem, then you wait a few weeks, you s explain the problem again, you send links to the code that shows it, you walk someone at Red Hat through exactly what you have to do, and then if you're lucky, you'll get a CV identifier. Oh, go away, keychain. So, with all these problems, why do we even use CVEs? The main reason is that we're expected to. If we don't use CVEs, then somebody else is going to make up the information and it will get propagated onto all these databases and we won't have any way of deciding what's true and what isn't. We have had this in the past. There are some problems listed on CVE, uh, CVE list, I think, that say there were some unfixed vulnerabilities in Plone 2.1 that never existed. And we can't get rid of them because they've got a CVE there. So if we aren't in control of this, someone else is going to take over for us. The next concept is severity. And severity is measured using the CVSS version 2 system. And this is the actual calculator that you use for getting the severities out that actually is a circuit board with an American flag overlaid. It, it's that kind of website. Um, these are split into three sections. There's the base, temporal, and environmental scores. As a vendor, we have to provide the base scores. And for a base score, we say, how easy is it to exploit something? What kind of problems with data integrity are you going to get? What kind of problems with denial of service? Um, how many forms of authentication do you need to... to exploit this vulnerability. It's, I think, six or seven questions. And then we get the base score. Once we've got a base score, users can, in theory, convert that into a targeted score by saying, um, has a fix been released yet? Do we actually care about denial of service? Do we care about data integrity? So if you were in uh, Hido Stevens' talk earlier, uh, you were speaking about working for a not-for-profit that governs the internet, so has a 100% uptime requirement. They can use this system to say, things that impact downtime are much more serious to us than normal customers, so they can then skew the scores to get the right information for them. That's also useful for the healthcare industry in the US, because if they have changes in data integrity, uh, they don't really, well, they get huge fines, but if it's a problem with denial of service, they don't really care because they're not going to get fined for it. It's just a bit embarrassing. Uh, I should have moved the slide earlier. And again, why do we use CVSS v2 scores? It's because if we don't do it, someone else will make up the information. If you look at um, various vulnerability uh, databases, you'll see for all of our vulnerabilities before about 2012, the, the numbers are completely random because whenever somebody put them in the database, they said, well, how scary does this look? I'll just assign a number to it. So we have a lot of things scored 9.7, which should probably be about five. So if we don't do it, someone else will. The other advantage is we can start to do stats on these so we can say Plone generally has um, less serious bugs than Drupal does. The final part of these three concepts is the CWE system, which even if you, oh, hello? Uh, okay, so the base score is just provided by the vendor. It is how difficult it is to uh, exploit a vulnerability objectively if you need to be authenticated, if you need to be on the same network segment, uh, if it's going to cause data loss, that kind of thing. The temporal score is 
how far have we got with fixing it? Is there a hot fix? Is there a new release? Uh, is it included on tools like Metasploit to say that it's going to be exploited really easily? And the third one is environmental, which is how much do I as a company care about uh, downtime? And there's even a few extra things in that system where you can say, downtime in the system causes loss of life, and then everything jumps up to 10 if you have something that can cause denial of service. But you will generally only see base scores or maybe temporal scores. Uh, environmental scores are very rarely used. I think only people that pay Red Hat to do it for them use them, but they're very useful. CWEs are the common weakness enumerations, which are ways of saying this particular vulnerability is of a certain class. If you were in uh, Hugh's talk yesterday, I think it was, he was speaking about cross-site request forgery and the OWASP top 10. The OWASP top 10 is the uh, open web application security project and they give a lot of advice on how to secure web applications, and every year they come out with a list of the 10 most serious vulnerabilities, or types of vulnerability. And in 2013, one of those was cross-site request forgery, which was given the identifier A8. But in 2010, it was the identifier A5. And when SANS did their ranking of the top 25 this year, they gave it number 12. So in order to keep track of these over the different years, we use the CWE system, which is generally a three-digit number, which will be common to all of them. So we can say, if something is CWE 352, we can then say, how many of these bugs were in the OWASP top 10 for this year, and how much do we relate to them? The CWE system has got 940 uh, listed at the moment. They're always adding new ones. There's lots of um, different uh, particular CWEs. One of the biggest problems that people have with them is that it's, it's a bit too granular. I'll get onto that in a moment. Uh, and the bottom two of these uh, are from the wrong slide. I'm very sorry, but they aren't relevant. Um, when I speak about granularity, one of the problems that people have with it is for example, CWE759, use of a one-way hash without a salt, which is obviously a problem if you're doing password sorting. You need to be sure that people aren't going to be able to reverse engineer your salts. This year, CWE916 was added, use of a password hash without, with insufficient computational effort, which is pretty much the same thing. And in fact, in the CWE dictionary, they say, that 916 is the parent of 759. But a lot of people get really upset about this because they say, well, use of a one-way hash without assault is actually the wrong way of fixing this. You should be making it harder. Lots of proper algorithms don't require assaults. So they're just very difficult to reverse engineer. So the CWE system is harmful because it's giving bad advice. When in fact, what it's doing is letting you very clearly narrow down exactly the problem you had. It's not how to fix it, it's exactly what was wrong. And if you've got 759, you've also got 916. Again, why do we use CWE? Because it lets us control what people say about us. Lots of vulnerability databases will say, Plone is particularly vulnerable to XSS vulnerabilities. And the way they do that is they look through all of the CW CVEs they've got, see what CWEs are associated, add them all up and put them in a table. So, CVE details is one of the major three vulnerability databases. It's, it looks like this. It's pretty out of date, as you can tell, when you see the total number of uh, vulnerabilities in Plone is listed as 21, with the most recent ones being in 2011. I'm sure you all remember doing hotfixes since then. The problem with the databases is they're all manually maintained. There's no way of pushing information to them. They don't get information from each other. So you have to wait for somebody whose job it is to type things into the database to go and type in your particular vulnerability. Uh, most of the information actually comes from reading a mailing list called OSS Security, which is the main way that we get access to CVE identifiers. Uh, 
a couple of companies are allowed to modify the National Vulnerability Database. I think Secunia and Vupin are the only ones that I've heard of. So if you manage to get Secunia to pick up a copy of your vulnerability announcement, then you'll always be up to date. Otherwise, it's almost certain you won't be. For Plone in particular, the last time the National Vulnerability Database was updated to include any information about Plone was November 2011. Same for CVE details. The open source vulnerability database, despite its name, it's awful for open source, was June 2010. So if you've used any of these services to compare what applications are secure, you've been misled. This particular graph is, chart, sorry, is from the German security study that was talk about uh, uh, late tomorrow. Tomorrow, uh, and this uses the same information from those three sources. It just sees which ones are in all three and assumes those are the correct numbers. So I know for a fact Drupal is missing about five, Plone's missing about ten. I don't know how many WordPress and Joomla ones are missing, but when you see a graph like this, you can be almost certain that it's incorrect. So please do not show these to your customers because they're working on data that's two or three years out of date and we have no way of changing that data. This particular chart is from the same uh, report by the German government and this shows CVEs. You can see from this that Plone is particularly vulnerable to XSS attacks uh, and has a, a few gain privileges, uh, a few denial of service, a few code execution. Uh, unfortunately, the colors aren't very good on this monitor, but that's about what we'd expect. The problem is, <coughs> oh, sorry. The problem is when we look at the other headings that we don't have any vulnerabilities for, such as gain information. CVE. 2013-4196 says, multiple information exposure flaws were found in the way object manager implementation of Plone uh, protected access to its internal methods. That's obviously, again, information leak, but it's about the same time as the survey was done, so we can't really fault them for missing that one. A year previously, though, CV 2012-5505, on some content types, an anonymous view lookup returns a private data structure, which under certain circumstances may be used to read out confidential data. If any of you were using annotations for private keys, you could have got it with this. And thanks to Rule of Four Digits for reporting this particular one, it was a lovely bug. So what are we going to do to make sure that these databases and these systems reflect what we need to give, uh, what information we need to give as open source projects? At first I thought, well, how about we just give everyone access to these databases so we can correct all the incorrect information? Kurt Seifried, who's one of the two people in the world who can issue CVEs, says, sadly, it probably won't work. Most projects barely care about security. Even fewer care about doing advisories correctly. So the reason we can't provide accurate information is because nobody cares. The Open Source Vulnerability Database, I uh, mentioned those people earlier, open source in their name doesn't mean open source as you and I interpret it. It means they take all of their information from open sources and then charge you access. <laughs> they say, use of the OSVDB and or API in a commercial atmosphere requires a license from OSF or a commercial partner of our designation. Failure to obtain a license for such use will result in account termination and legal action as necessary. As part of the same FAQ, they say, if you're using Nmap or mod security in a commercial environment, you have to buy a license from us because they use their information. Yeah. Another problem is the single points of failure. I've mentioned a few times already that Kurt is one of two people who's allowed to issue CV numbers. The other is Steve Christie, uh, who, I put a quote up earlier about databases being very out of date. When I asked him if there was anything I could do to help him issue CVs in a more timely manner, he said, remember, this is supposed to be basically a small side part of my job at Red Hat, and sometimes I get slammed and grumpy. This is one of two people who can issue vulnerability identifiers for open source projects. Steve hasn't responded to my emails for over a year. 
So, I think what we need is a wiki type system where you have untrusted users, you have editors and moderators, and anyone can put information in here, and anyone can tag it and update it, but if you don't know what you're doing, you don't get access to all the fancy bells and whistles. Another problem is we need to stop using CVEs. It's increasingly difficult for us to get them assigned to Plone, and people are using them for stats whether or not we want it. So we need to have some sort of way of assigning temporary IDs that then get converted into CVEs, hopefully some point down the line. We need to make sure that not only we can access it, but people at Drupal can access it, because Drupal have exactly the same problems as us. And we need to make sure that whatever data goes in can be pulled out, because if we were to just use the OSVDB, we could put all of our information in there, and then none of you would be able to use it in your consulting companies. You couldn't even search to see what problems were employing without having to buy a license. Also, slightly less important, we need to modify the way CVSS v2 works. Currently, it is designed for any type of vulnerability in any type of system. So if you're working on a timing attack on smart cards, you use CVSS v2 just as if you use a website. But that means that a lot of the options simply aren't applicable. There are very few types of attack on a web app that require you to be on the same network segment rather than just being able to route to that address. So we need to expand this system out. Currently, if we find a vulnerability in Plone, it's almost certainly five out of 10, maybe 7.3, maybe 10, maybe 2.1. Those are pretty much the only numbers we ever get out of this calculation. We also need to separate out the CVE system from the vulnerabilities. As I mentioned earlier, if the version numbers of a problem are slightly different, then you get two different CVEs. By the same token, you can save up a load of vulnerabilities and do them all in one batch. So if we find a CSRF bug, we can choose not to tell anybody about it, wait till we find three or four more, and then claim they were the same bug and only get one CVE number out of it. Or we can do the responsible thing and fix them each time and get four vulnerabilities. So we need to stop rewarding people for hiding security problems in their applications. Now, does anybody have any questions about that, or do they want me to go back and repeat things that were completely unintelligible? If you're proposing to create such a system, are you saying that you're planning to do that? Uh, I'm not planning to yet, because I want to talk to other security teams about it, and whenever I speak to them, they say, yeah, it's awful, it's really, really bad, we can't get anything done, but, they get shut, uh, things get shot down by people like Red Hat who have built businesses on the system of CVEs and providing uh, fixes to commercial clients. <coughs> yeah, I don't really want anyone to be coming to Plone with security and vulnerabilities in mind because they might start finding things. And that would make my job a lot harder. David? Well, the problem would be that, well, one problem would be we'd lose a lot of marketing ability because other content management systems could just point to Plone and say they don't even try with security, they haven't even asked for CVE identifiers. Another problem is it would mean that other people would request them on our behalf and they would most likely get information wrong because before we started requesting these, we, there was a lot of incorrect information floating around. Vulnerabilities before about 2010 have been severely underestimated in Plone because we didn't supply the correct information and people guessed. Anyone else? Uh, or used in Plone as a system, 
maybe it could be a possible policy for us to stay in touch, come in touch with them and try to fix your recommendations. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, the security community as a whole is very large. It's not just open source systems. So I've said a few times there are two people who can issue CVs for open source. Microsoft gets issued a batch of 250 at a time if they want them. Same with Oracle, same with lots of other big companies. And they just pay money to MITRE and they sit on an editorial board and they sit around a big table a couple of times a year, probably at Black Hat, and saying, well, I'm not sure if this vulnerability is quite well enough described, we should put some more work into that. And it's entirely predicated around commercial interests. So it's very difficult indeed for us to split out in a formal way. And obviously, I'd welcome any help we could get. But none of the information that would be showing on these databases would be linked with the commercial ones, because there's no way that Microsoft will tell us their particular vulnerabilities. And the, currently, the only way to find out is to sign up to a service like Vupin, who will, for $100,000 a year, send you all the information they've managed to get out of these commercial entities. Matt? As, uh, I really want that to happen. <laughs> at, at the moment, so many people get burnt out on this. I mean, you'll have seen from the plan security team, the people writing the announcements change regularly off, quite regularly, because when we write the announcements, we go through all of this procedure with them. And the next time there's a vulnerability, we don't want to do it again. We want someone else to do it. And the same problem is happening with every single security team in open source, because as, well, as Kurt says, most projects barely care about security, even fewer care about doing advisories correctly. The reason for them not caring is because there are four people in the world they can talk to. There's Kurt and Stephen, who can issue the CVEs, and there are the two Yans that work for the Red Hat security team that will actually help you provide this information to them. And if you don't go via the two Yans, then your information gets put in a backlog. When I asked Kurt about this, he said, well, I work with Jan, I can trust that he's got it right. Red Hat is the only reason at the moment that open source security has got any way of communicating vulnerabilities to the public. Without them helping us out, we would have no way of doing it. Surely this must be a pain. Red Hat were originally doing it. Um, as I say, Stephen hasn't been responding to my emails for a while now. Um, I think the problem is, although they hate being the only ones to do it, they also love that they're in control of it. And it means that Red Hat gets special placement. When Red Hat emails us saying, can we please have copies of your unit tests or information about how you fix this bug, we pretty much have to give it to them. Because if we don't, then we're not going to be able to get things listed on these websites. Or if we do it, all will be incorrect. To give you an example, the last hotfix, we had a problem that allowed you to uh, redirect a user to a website outside of Plum. Fairly simple, open redirect type bug, probably scored two or three out of 10 on the CVSS scale. We didn't respond to Red Hat quickly enough, so they sent us a list of their guesses, and they'd put that down as a 10 out of 10 code execution vulnerability. Anyone else? Have I made everyone sad? Do your faces look like that now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How much time do I have? I haven't been paying attention. Where am I supposed to finish? Oh, okay. Well, let's go then. Thanks. Thanks very much.